In this video, we're going to talk about the most confusing thing about The Witcher's Season 1 on Netflix. That is the timeline of the three major storylines of Yennefer, Geralt, and Ciri. Subscribe and hit the bell notification icon so you get the latest news on The Witcher Netflix or tips and tricks for The Witcher games. We're going to start out with no spoilers and as we go along and get deeper into how we came up with the timeline then we'll talk more about the history of the continent and the world of the witcher uh, which may have some minor plot spoilers but we're going to focus mainly on things that tell us about exactly what the timeline is but if you haven't watched the witcher yet you can still stay tuned for a little while while i give you the basic rundown for the early episodes so I've watched all the episodes, and I've researched the lore, and read the books, and the first thing that you should know, and this is totally spoiler-free, so if you haven't watched the episodes, don't worry about it, is that in the first episode, Geralt is in a timeline that's about 30 years before series. So the year in the world of The Witcher I think Geralt is operating in, in episode one is 1234, and Ciri is operating in 1263. So all the Sintran scenes are in 1263, all the scenes with Ciri, all the series with uh, scenes with the Nilfgaardians are in 1263, and then 29 years earlier, where we see Geralt and Renfri, it's going to be in 1234. Okay, in episode two, where we meet Yennefer the Hunchback, that starts out in 1185, and that may span several years, but that starts in 1185, so that's about 80 years before Ciri's timeline. And then Geralt, his timeline is moving closer to Ciri's, it's 1250, so he's about, about 13 years uh, before he meets Ciri, and it's about, uh, it's about 80 years to start out with before Yennefer gets up to Ciri's timeline. And so throughout the season, uh, Yennefer's timeline and Geralt's timeline are getting closer to Ciri's timeline. Ciri's timeline is going to only take place during a few weeks or a few months in 1263, according to the calendar they have on the continent in the world of the Witcher. So in episode three, Yennefer's timeline is jumping up to 1222, and Geralt's timeline is, is moving up around 1252. And then by episode four, five, and six, Geralt and Yennefer are essentially at the same time, uh, and whether or not they're meeting with each other. So for episode four, I think Geralt and Yennefer are, are in 1252, Episode 5, I'd say about 1256. Episode 6 at 1258. All this time, Ciri is still in 1263. And it's not until episode 7 that they're all in 1263. And they'll be in 1263, the same essential timeline for episodes 7 and 8. All right, so that's all I'm going to say in the non-spoiler portion. And then we're going to get to some more spoiler things. But they're going to be light spoilers. I'm not going to focus on the plot so much as I'm going to talk about why I came up, how I was able to came, come up with this. So there are a few things that we know. We know when Yennefer was born, according to the lore. Uh, we we know the dates of some of the battles that they mentioned. We know when uh, one of the princesses was born. Actually, several of the princesses were born. And we know how old people look in the episode or how they're Talk, how old they're talked about in the episode. The most confusing person in terms of figuring out her age is Yennefer. Uh, but it's it's you can't really look at Yennefer and Geralt uh, to their age because because she's a sorceress and he's a witcher. They don't really age like normal humans. They age very slowly. So their age on screen is not going to be indicative of how old they are. So the first thing we know is that in 1263 was the sack of Sintra, right? And the end's beginning, episode one, is basically the end of the story because we get back to the sack of Sintra in episode eight. Uh, but 
it's uh it's also the beginning of the story for Siri, but it's towards the end of the story for Geralt. Okay, so there's this scene where Princess Renfri says, makes a reference to Queen Kalenthi and her victory, and that victory. Because I was a girl born during an eclipse, I could have become so many things. Queen Kalanthe of Sintra. She just won her first battle lot of Hoshbaz. But here I am trying to convince you I'm not. A monster. That victory, we know the date of, and we know how old Queen Kalenthi was at that time. And that is why we can say that Geralt and Princess Renfri in the lesser evil B Butcher of Blaviken story was in 1234 because she makes a reference to a battle that Queen Kalenthi, the young Queen Kalenthi won, and that allows us to date Geralt and Renfri's story. So the, the Lord tells us that Yen was born in 1173, and it looks like to me, seems reasonable based on how she behaves and how things work in this medieval town that Yennefer the Hunchback is about 12. And I'm going with that she's 12, but she could be uh, 13, 14. I really doubt that she would be 16, 17, 18. It's possible, but I would go for she's in her uh, early teens or right before her teenage years. But her time at the School for Sorceresses at Eratusa probably spans several years. So when we get to the scene where some of the novices are not promoted and kind of demoted, I won't tell you how they're demoted, uh, but that we don't know how many years have been passed. And although we do see two instances of them doing magic, but they probably did magic a lot. And these are just two of the lessons that they highlight for us. But probably a lot of time passes uh, for Yennefer at Eratusa from the beginning of the episode and the end of the episode. But we can say that she's roughly 35 years uh, behind Geralt and uh, roughly 80 years behind Ciri at the start of the episode. So the dating for episodes 2, 3, and 4, well, 2 and 3 for Geralt are a guesstimate. But one of the core things is that Geralt doesn't age, um, Yennefer doesn't age, but the bard Jaskier, or Yaskier, who English language readers or game players will know as Dandelion, the bard Yaskier or Dandelion does age. And at the end of the games, which is a few years after the end of the books, He's still a fairly young man. He's not a feeble man. Uh, he may be in his early middle age, but he's not in his. He's probably not in his late middle age, or definitely not his old age. So I would say, uh, by the time you see Dandelion in Blood and Wine, he's probably not uh, over forty-five. And Blood and Wine takes place in twelve seventy-five. Uh, Witcher one begins in twelve seventy. Witcher three begins in twelve seventy-two. And the books end in uh, 1268, right? So the series is going to end in 1268. And I think it's reasonable to say that Yasky or Dandelion is probably before his 40th birthday by the end of the books. And it's probably before his, the start of his uh, 40th birthday or just after the start of his 40th birthday in the games. So my guesstimate is that Dandelion is 20, uh, when he meets Geralt uh, at the Edge of the World short story in the Four Marks episode in episode two, and that he's 45 at the end of Blood and Wine. And that's a period of 25 years have passed since he first met Geralt in the pub. So the next major thing that we're going to rely on is that Ada the White, that is Princess Ada, who in episode three was changed from a striga back into a princess, uh, was born in 1239, okay? Uh, she is the daughter of King Foltest of Tamaria and Ada, the princess of Tamaria. And we see them in that episode, uh, episode three, Betrayer Moon. We see the mother of the striga, 
who's the sister of King Foltest, who's a Prince Foltest. And they look like they're about 10 or 11, or I would say Foltest looks like he's 10, and Ada, the sister, looks like she's 9. In episode 3, Betray... Foltest and Ada, what happened to them? Foltest, leave your sister be. Show Madame de Brie some respect. What wonderful children, Your Highness. Thank you. Clarence, eh? Good luck with that. Word is, she's even more stubborn than her father is. How fares Nilfgaard? King Fergus is proving to be an effective and excitable young king. Horny, she means. And you're spending the kingdom's money on women as his people starve to death. Fringilla will be in Nilfgaard by week's end. She will bring sanity and bread to the people. Your girl is, with all due respect, your niece is only capable of doing what she's told. <sighs> No ambitious mage wants to be signed anywhere south of Sutton. But Nilfgaard needs correcting. Perhaps we consider sending someone there with a bit more spine. Struggable, did you have anyone in mind? What about your hunchback protege? The honor is mine. King Fergus chose this. Not me. King Fergus of Nilfgaard? What are you talking about? Episode 3, Betrayer Moon. We also meet King Vilferil of Adern, and they make references uh, to they make references to King Fergus of Nilfgaard. So it's between Yennefer and Fringilla Vigo, who will be placed in Adern and who will be placed in Nilfgaard. And the king in Adern is Vilferil, and the king in Nilfgaard is Fergus. Fergus is the father of Emir Var Emrys, who is the emperor of Nilfgaard in 1263 during this series. But that man is uh, was knocked out by an usurper at some time between 1263 and when the mages are talking. The other thing we know is that Calanthe is a princess, but she is not the queen. So she became the queen in 1232. So the time period has to be before 1232 when Calanthe ascended to be queen of Sintra when Queen Calanthe was born, and she was born in 1218. So we've narrowed it down between 1218 and 1232. King Virfril won a battle against the Temeria, King Metal, who's a father of both Ada and Foltest, in 1226. And it seems likely that we wouldn't see Ada and Foltest had that battle already been waged. But it doesn't have, we're not going to lay our dating of Yennefer's timeline on that entirely. We also know that Yen and Geralt's timelines converge at the last wish, right? So they're in the same time period in the last wish. And I'm going to take a leap that Netflix wants us to believe that the stories happen in order. And that's something that uh, Sapkowski really doesn't ever weigh in on. So Andre Sapkowski is the author of the Witcher novels and short stories. And he's really not a guy into creating a lot of history. He creates uh, stories based on what he thinks of. He tries to tie them into the world that he's done. But he's not like George R. R. Martin, who, for instance, has written several history books of the world of Westeros and uh, the world. He's not done that. Uh, indeed, Sapkowski's never drawn a map, so the maps that we have are, are pretty much produced by CD Projekt Red, but other people, you know, will draw their own maps. But a lot of the kind of history background and the actual timing of the stories, I don't even think Sapkowski is settled on that. But I believe that Netflix wants us to believe that Geralt's stories are in order, except for his flashbacks in episode after he's injured. 
but those were obviously flashbacks. But the stories, as we see with Geralt, are in order. So I'm going to take that assumption. So putting all those things together, uh, we know that the Striga Atta was born in 1239. And she was 14 when she was cured by Geralt. So that would put Geralt's story at 1253. We also know that in 1252, Pavetta and Dooney were married, and that's episode four. So it seems like episode three in the timeline for Geralt should happen after episode four. But I'm going to take the leap and say that Netflix wants us to believe that Betrayer Moon happened before episode four of Banquets, Bastards, and Burials for Geralt. And so instead of Ada being 14 when she's saved, let's just say she's 13 and she was saved by Geralt. Her curse was lifted in 1252, the same year as Pavetta and Dooney were betrothed to be married, the same year that Calanthe and Iced were betrothed. So at the end of episode three for Yennefer's story, Yennefer was assigned to the court of King Virful of Adern. In episode four, she says in the cart that she's been working for him for 30 years. So Yen has a time jump of 30 years from episode three's end to the start and end of episode four because it's a, a short period of time, obviously, when she's being chased uh, with Queen Khalees of Lyria. As a side note, uh, she, Queen Khalees is the mother of Maeve, who ends up being the queen of Lyria and Rivia. And people that play Thronebreaker will get to know Queen Maeve quite a bit. And Queen Khalees makes a reference to her other daughter, Maeve, in that episode. So the key assumption is, what age was Ada of Tamaria when she gave birth to Ada the White, who becomes the Striga. And that's up for debate. I don't know an answer to that. The most convenient answer, I think, is that she was 27. If she was born earlier, uh, then the seeing her at age nine in Yennefer's storyline is going to mess up the convergence of Yennefer and Geralt's storyline. So, if anything, having Ada give birth to the Striga Ada earlier uh, makes Yennefer's storyline make sense. The only problem with this, and I'm going to go with that, that, that Ada, the first Ada, Ada Sr., was 27 when she gave birth to the Striga Ada. And the, the Sr. Ada died, but the Striga Ada lived on to be cured by Geralt of Rivia in Episode 3. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that Netflix, or at least the actresses in Netflix, are aware of Yennefer's birthday of 12 or 1173 because they've made reference to it about how old she is by the end of the series. But it creates some inconvenience for the way that they told the story. And I think that's probably why they never put dates to any of the things, because then it would make parts of the story seem a little implausible. So one of the key things that happens in episode three is that Yennefer goes through her enchantments and they literally burn her uterus so she cannot have kids while she's going. Some sort of sacrifice, a sacrifice akin to the sacrifice of Varys's genitalia in Game of Thrones by some mysterious mage. We don't know why they make that sacrifice, but they do make the sacrifice. The thing that loses the potency of that sacrifice is by that time, Yennefer is most likely 50. She's been at Eratusa for over 30 years, probably closer to 40 years. So she's probably well past her childbearing years anyway. And the fact that she doesn't look like she's 50 either indicates that she's already gone through some sort of uh, metabolism or, or aging slowdown that other sorceresses go through. So sorceresses don't age, uh, like witchers don't age. 
but she's definitely far beyond her childbearing years. And I think any, unless you move up Yennefer's date of birth, say 30 years or at least 25 years, it's going to make it seem a little bit implausible that she uh, she was actually giving up much in that particular scene. Instead, I think the way to think about that scene is that it was a metaphor for this highly educated woman who spent most of her life in education, and the price of that was that she was not able to bear children during her childbearing years, and by the time she got to the end of it, she no longer was fertile. But the little interpretation of that scene is they literally burned her uterus and she was not able to have kids because of that magical sacrifice, which seems to have nothing to do with straightening her back and straightening her jaw so that she looks pretty. So I think we should view that scene in a metaphorical sense. And I think that's the way that Netflix did. But they they also viewed it as a very literal way to tell Yennefer's story. And then once you pick the her story, and then once you pick the date 1222 for Yennefer, then you add 30 years, that gives her 1252, just like Geralt's timeline, even though they don't meet. And then they have to meet sometime between... 1252 and 1263 in the last wish story in episode five and they have to meet sometimes after the last wish story uh, to the bounds of reason story or episode six with the dragon and i'm going to take the position that that was about 1252 in episode four for both Geralt and Yennefer, which the 1252 number is based on more of the, the deduction from these historic dates. And then the 1256 number for The Witcher Netflix and 1258 are guesses, but in about this proper timeline. A few years have passed be between uh, 1252 and when Geralt meets Yennefer in Rind. And a few years have passed when Geralt meets Yennefer hunting the dragon. And then by episode 7, it's clear they're in 1263, right? It's right before the Sack of Sintra. So they get to 1263. The, the potential Sack of Sintra is being discussed then. We have the actual Sack of Sintra in episode 8. We have the actual Battle of Sodden in episode eight all those things only happen in 1263 and so in summary yennefer has a much longer timeline than any of the other characters even though we don't see her until episode two and we see Geralt and siri in episode one Geralt has the second longest timeline uh stretching nearly 30 years yennefer's timeline stretches nearly 80 years series timeline is all within the same year subscribe and hit the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next video we cover the witcher netflix